Here we go. Oh, you got to walk. Oh, you, you got, got to walk. walk. That lonesome valley. That lonesome valley. You got to walk. You, you got, got to walk. walk. It by yourself. By yourself. Ain't nobody here. Ain't nobody, nobody here. Else. Can walk it for you. Can walk it for you. you. You got to walk. walk that lonesome valley. It by yourself. yourself. Now some folks say. Some, Some folks say John was a Baptist. John was a Baptist. Some folks say. Some, Some folks say he was a Jew. He was a Jew. But the holy. But the holy. Bible tells us. Bible tells us that he was, was a preacher too. too. Sing it now. Yes, you got to walk. You got to walk that lonesome valley. That lonesome valley. You got to walk. You got to walk it by yourself. By yourself. Nobody here. Nobody here can walk it for you. Walk it for you. You got to walk that lonesome valley by yourself. Now here's a verse Woody Guthrie I think made up. Now though the road, though the road be rough and rocky, be rough and rocky, and the hills, and the hills be steep and high, be steep and high, we can sing, we can sing as we go marching, as we go marching, and we'll win that one big union by and by, by and by. Oh, you got to walk. You got to walk that lonesome valley. That lonesome valley. You got to walk. You got to walk by yourself. By yourself. Nobody here. And nobody here can walk it for you. Can walk it for you. You got to walk that lonesome valley by yourself. Walk it by yourself. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness! I guess I guess that was what it was. You, you got your headphones back on, Pete. You with us? Now I got my headphones back on. <laughs> and uh, uh, I mentioned I couldn't hear you, but I assume you were there. And not only that, we're going to go house by house and make sure the listeners are singing along with us. That's how we'll do it. <laughs> uh, I mentioned earlier that you have intersected in the most unlikely ways with rock and roll and popular culture. And I'm guessing that one of those left field surprises for you had to be an album called The Seeger Sessions about uh, a year or so ago. You know what I'm talking about. Tell me yes, how Bruce you found out all of your impressions. I mean, did that just come like... Uh, you know, manna from above? How, how did you view it? <laughs> it was quite unexpected. Uh, I found about it after they'd already made the record. Well, I bet you, you could have showed them a thing or two while they were making it. That was a mistake on their part. Not necessarily. No, I was, <laughs> uh, I'm quite delighted, though. The reason he made the record was that uh, somebody had wanted him to listen to some of my records, and his children heard it, and one of his... Uh, children said, hey, that sounds like fun. And he <laughs> thought, hey, if they think it's fun, maybe others would too. It is fun. Who knows? Maybe that's the constant through all of this. Maybe that is why your concerts are so multi-generational and this music is uh, multi-generational. And, and it points, if nothing else, Pete, it points out the success of your lifelong mission to get these songs sung, not have them slip through the cracks, reach new audiences who miss them by, by just an accident of birth. Roger does that uh, every month with his, his Folk Den project, uh, and I, I'm sure the two of you have uh, a, a lot in common on that score, too. And now here is perhaps, you know, the biggest name in rock and roll right now, and he chooses... You know, not to put a little pen light on your work, but to flash this big Klieg light on it for a year of performances and songs. 
and tours. Uh, what reflected back to you as a result of uh, Bruce's album and, and that project? All I can know is that uh, I'm singing for the kids in my hometown like never before. <laughs> uh, that's great. <laughs> Did you know Bruce, Pete? I'd met him very, very briefly once at, at the funeral for John Hammond, the great jazz man. He was, oh, yeah, he sure. was uh, working with Bruce way back, oh, decades ago. Yeah. Uh, he, he was your then, producer. That's right. And then I met Bruce later at the Grammy Awards, where uh, I was supposed to say five or six words. All I need was going to say... I had to recite something and then say, and now I give you my friend Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> and he, he sang a ballad about Tom Joad. Uh, I, I want to get your take, Pete. I see him so clearly in the lineage that maybe begins with Woody and you and then passes down to uh, Bob Dylan and Roger McGuinn. And it, it moves forward to uh, another generation through... Bruce, there are many people carrying your torch, but I don't think there are, there's anyone with more visibility or uh, clout right now than Bruce to be carrying that torch. Do you see it that way in some sense? You know, the, you never can predict what's going to happen. Uh, as I always say, God only knows what the future is going to be. And people who think they can control this country <laughs> are being continually frustrated you know, Plato is supposed to have said it's very dangerous to allow the wrong kind of music in the country. And I know that for, quote, yeah. For centuries, not just decades, uh, the people who run this country have tried to control the music. And they succeed for a long while. During the 1930s, there was one uh, nice, happy song after another. Wrap your troubles in dreams and dream your troubles away. This is a Bing Crosby hit in 1933, I think. Uh, this is in the middle of the Great Depression when millions were out of work and there was real hunger and desperation. Uh, but there's one happy song after another, <laughs> at least on the radio. Of course, there were other songs being written, but only nuts like me knew about them. Pete, your, your grandson makes the point that turn, turn, turn had it right, that there is a season for all things, and sometimes it's very extreme. So here was a man who, in some sense, was persecuted by his government and by the uh, corporate national media in the United States, and suddenly you found yourself in a box at the Kennedy Center being honored with one of their Lifetime Achievement Awards, uh, by President Clinton, sitting uh, sitting in the box with you, I suppose, uh, and watching no. watching what unfolded uh, on the stage. What was in your mind? Can you remember that moment of sitting there? You're not you know you don't have to speak at these things, which is one of the things I think makes it more comfortable mm -hmm. for the honoree. But you're obviously up there drinking all of this in, your fellow honorees <laughs> who are the best at what they do, yourself being included in, in well, their there was number. there's Aretha Franklin right next Aretha, to me. Yeah. Bam, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do, do you have any recollections of what was running through your mind in that box in, on that I night? was laughing. It's so unexpected. <laughs> so unexpected. <laughs> Oh, you never know what's going to happen. God only knows what the future is going to be. And I certainly mm -hmm. never predicted that something like this would happen. Pete has a good line. If you, if you can't beat them, outlive them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my. Uh, are honors like that uh, meaningful for you, Pete? Well, keep in mind that what I'm really honored most by is that on the streets of my hometown, when I walk down, uh, folks say, Hi, Pete, uh, or Hi, Toshi, when they see my wife. Uh, when we go down to pick up the mail at the post office, oh, my gosh, poor Toshi, it comes in by the bushel now. Uh, <laughs> we, I should have a staff. Most men tie their wives to a sink, but poor Toshi's been tied to a <laughs> table full of paper. And I have oh. a copying machine so I can... Uh, runoff copies of a form letter. Dear so-and-so, I got your letter. I got the 
record you sent me, but I don't have time to listen to it. I got 50 more letters like that <laughs> this last week. I'm absolutely not surprised that it's uh, it's it's one-to-one contact with uh, the fans and the people who spread your message that uh, is infinitely more important than the statuettes or the gold records or, or, or any of those things. I'm not surprised at all. None of those are on display at Pete's house. Matter of fact, I, I would say that Pete is uncomfortable with all that. Yeah. I don't want to speak for him, but I think he's uncomfortable with being so Well, I tell to people Pete. that politicians and musicians tend to be in the publicity racket. Uh, people are hired <laughs> to get you publicity. People are hired to sell tickets and so on. And uh, in every community, there are extraordinary people Maybe a woman that raises a big family with hardly any money, but they all turn out good. And, uh, or some man who's heroically rescued somebody, and nobody uh, gets them publicity. <laughs> Sometimes School teachers. <laughs> that's right, school teachers. Uh, scattering seeds, never knowing if one of their students may take up that seed and, and really do something with it. Pete, I have a suggestion for you to help this movie. Uh, check yourself into a rehab center. That's the best way to get publicity these days. Right? <laughs> you, you'll be you'll be in every newspaper and on every magazine show in in the country. That's that's the absurdity of uh, life in the media world today, and and it's so great to see someone like you do an end run around that. And you are really an unlikely person to have crossed paths with uh, moments in pop culture and rock culture that you have. One of them certainly happened that night at the, uh, at the Kennedy Center when Roger took to the stage to honor you and to talk about that song now that will in perpetuity be inseparable uh, between the two of you. Turn, turn, turn. Let's give credit to the fellow who actually wrote those words originally in Hebrew. Uh, Solomon, his name was right? Kaheleth. Oh, and he Kahaleth. lived 252 years before Jesus. Uh, they say it was after the Greeks charged through that way of part of the world because the style of poetry it was is a Greek style where you repeat a, a word at the beginning of a line over and over. All I did was rearrange the lines so they rhymed a little better in English and added six words of my own at the very end. I swear it's not too late. Hmm. Right, but because it said a time for peace, I swear it's not too late. It became a protest song. Yeah, isn't didn't that it? funny? Yeah. Uh, I understand. What was, the ge- what was the gentleman's name again, Pete? Kahalith. Kahalith. I understand. K O H E L E T H. If you want to put spell it in English. <laughs> I understand that Kahalith is pissed off that he didn't get any royalties and is taking you to court on that. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm. I've been. I and some friends have started a little campaign that when you put new words to some ancient, put new melodies to an ancient set of words, some of the royalties should go to the place and the people. For example, with the song Abi Yo-Yo, it's an African lullaby, uh, 50% of the royalties now go to a little corner of South Africa where that lullaby came from hundreds of years ago. Nobody knows. That sounds fair. And uh, I sent uh, $10,000 to a wonderful anthropology professor in Israel who's trying to bring uh, Jews and Palestinians together. It's a very strong movement in both Palestine and Israel, a minority movement, but it is slowly but steadily growing, just like the peace movement in this country is slowly but steadily growing. 